are listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Ms. Rakta, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 4, page 58. I am one of your hosts, Rish Outfield. And I am Big Anklevich. That's O eight O T, And? And? Now how's your man? Hey. Uh, huh? You're up. See you guys later. I'm going for a smoke break. Already? We, do, we just started. Your point is? Hey, announcer man, you only do three things every week. You you introduce us, you say some asinine thing in the middle of the show, and then you do the legalese <laughs> at the end. Come on! Why do you say this to me when you know I will kill you for it? Oh, sorry. Did, did uh, he just threaten? Uh, I think he was quoting a movie. I don't know. It's... Well, he didn't do it very well then. <laughs> That's probably true. Okay, you enjoy your cancer stick, sir. <laughs> Uh, what's next? Today's story is Hangman by Abby Rustad. Abby Merck Rustad is foiled in her plans for world domination by the voices in her head. Constant warfare with characters who will not shut up can do that to a person. She enjoys reading and writing horror, fantasy, sci-fi, and weird fiction. Anything with zombies and elder gods also makes her day. Dude, is she married? Does it say... Uh, uh, no. Sorry, you'll have to find out on your own. Okay, thanks. Merck has had short stories published in Alternative Coordinates, Embrain SF, Fusion Fragment, Alien Skin Magazine, and Flash Scribe, among others. Visitors are welcome at her blog, merck-rants.blogspot.com. Don't worry, the zombies don't bite. Mostly. <laughs> Hangman was first published in Alien Skin Magazine in the February-March 2008 issue. Hangman by Abby Merck Rustad It's Pickle, Emily said. My turn. Craig scowled and slammed the piece of chalk down on the lip of the blackboard. The chalk broke. You always figure out my words... Emily rolled her eyes. Don't be such a sore loser. Craig traded places with Emily and plopped down in the office swivel chair. Come on, let's play something else. No, I like Hangman, Emily said. I don't. Too bad. Craig glowered at his cousin. Why did Mom always insist he do what Emily wanted to do when she stayed over? It wasn't fair. Emily scratched out ten lines on the blackboard. Okay, start guessing. Craig thrust out his lower lip. This is boring, Em. No, it's not, doofus. Guess. You're older. You know more words than I do. Emily shrugged and tossed her braids. Craig sulked. He listed off random letters, knowing he couldn't win. Craig tiptoed into the darkened library. It was so crammed with boxes it was hard to walk without tripping. He swung his flashlight back and forth, creating different blotches of shadow with each sweep. He'd show that stuck-up know-it-all Emily. He'd find a word she didn't know, and then he'd win the next game of Hangman. Craig scanned the oldest-looking books Dad owned, lined on a shelf. Better not take one of those, he decided. Dad would miss them. On a high shelf near the window, Craig spotted a massive book, an old dictionary. Perfect. He heaved a box of National Geographic magazines over to stand on. He set his flashlight down, and the shadows scrunched closer around him. Craig's heart beat faster. If Mom or Dad caught him, he climbed onto the box. His fingertips brushed the spine of the dictionary, but he couldn't get a good hold. Darn it, he wasn't tall enough. Craig took a deep breath, then jumped. He caught the top of the dictionary this time, but he overbalanced, and the book came crashing down. Craig screamed. He tumbled and banged his head on a box. Tears from the sharp pain popped into his eyes. The dictionary bounced against the floor and fell open, face down. Pages crumpled. Oh, no. Craig scrambled up, rubbing his head. Dad was going to kill him for messing up the library. He snatched his flashlight. Footsteps sounded in the hall. Mom must have heard the noise. Close to panic, Craig lugged the dictionary up and slammed it closed. A piece of paper squirted out. 
He grabbed it. Where did it go? Was it a page that had come loose? With no time to figure it out, Craig stuffed the paper into the pocket of his pajamas. He flicked off the flashlight and hid behind the door as it opened. Mom's frazzled head craned in. Stupid cat. (sighs) She sighed and closed the door. Craig held his breath and waited. He counted in his head until he was sure Mom had gone back to bed. Then he opened the door and dashed for his bedroom. He dove under the covers and lay still, his heart hammering. Forever passed. No one was coming to yell at him for the mess in the library. Craig sat up and clicked on his flashlight to look at the page. It was old, yellowed, and had spidery writing on it. The ink looked reddish, like it was still wet. Craig squinted at the sheet. This was one weird dictionary page. Still, it had a word spelled in English he could make out in the middle of the page in bold capitals. Mzrakta. Craig shivered when he read it. He didn't know why. Still, it was a word, even if he didn't know what it meant. It would stump Emily for sure. I get to go first, Craig said. He marked out eight dashes on the blackboard. Emily started with vowels, but as she moved into the consonants, her face reddened. Craig drew the last hand of the hangman and grinned. I won. You didn't guess it. This can't be a word. It is too. Craig's chest swelled with satisfaction. He had beaten his cousin at last at her own game. I don't believe you. Emily glared at him. Prove it. Craig pulled the sheet of old paper from his jeans pocket and held it up, triumphant. I found it in a dictionary. He finished writing out Mzragta on the chalkboard. What is that? Emily frowned. That's not a word. Yeah, it is. Oh, really? So how do you pronounce it, huh, wise guy? Craig had hoped she wouldn't ask. The paper didn't have a phonetic way to say the word. He tried anyway. His tongue felt heavy and full of fuzz, and the syllable rolled off it. Mzrakta. The hangman on the board began screaming. The walls of the office buckled and cracked. Wind exploded in a whirling vortex from every corner. A horrible red light blasted through the window and the open door. Emily screamed. Craig screamed louder. They both dropped to the floor and tried to hide behind each other. Craig couldn't believe what he was seeing. This was a bad dream. He wanted to wake up. The chalkboard twisted and writhed, melting into a series of long, snaky black ropes. They shook and flailed. Then one shot out, shaped like a noose, and grabbed Emily around the throat. Craig grasped for her, but the tentacle thing wrenched her up too high for him to reach. The chalkboard squeezed, and Emily's head popped off. In a daze, Craig crawled for the cover of the desk. A tentacle caught his ankle and yanked him back. Pain shot through his leg, and he gasped. Then a second black rope whipped around his neck. Craig's feet left the ground, and he stared up into the thing that had been a chalkboard. It roared. The tentacle around his neck squeezed tighter. He should have let Emily win this game of hangman. Author's note. Hi, I'm Abby Rustin, the Twisted Mind uh, author behind Hangman. This short popped into existence while I was on my lunch break one day at work. I was sketching stick figures in my notebook, and all at once I wondered how someone could take the game of Hangman and turn it into a weapon. I always lose at that game too, since it's more fun to watch the little stick figure materialize than, you know, solve the word puzzle. It would have to involve arcane books, I mused, as the idea began to percolate. The zombie hamsters turning the wheels in my head started doing double time. What would happen if you played hangman with a name that should not be spoken and summoned up a monster? I spent the rest of my lunch break furiously scribbling down the story and finished it with minutes to spare. Alien Skin Magazine published it in their February-March 2008 issue, much to my delight. I hope you enjoyed it, but don't blame me if you get a sudden desire not to play the game Hangman anymore. Thanks for listening. A 
right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story. I know that you did. I did because I got to read that story and that was a good time. I read the story. Well, I got to scream a lot. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that was his scream. We had the option of stealing your scream or star scream. Some scream out there. A Wilhelm, maybe. <coughs> but we thought, no, our listeners really want to hear Big Anklevich in pain. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It's mostly just me that wanted to hear him scream. But, you know, another one of my New Year's resolutions. All right. You really uh, you really took that to heart. I'm, I'm impressed. Well, that, that went on and on, didn't it? A little bit. Sadly, that's not what she said. <clears throat> Thank you, Abby, for sending us that story. You know how we were complaining. Okay, I was complaining last week about how long that poor bastard, a friendly, talented writer, had to wait before we got his episode in on the air. Well, I would say the hangman has to be the shortest span from somebody sending us the story to it going on the air. Mostly just because... Wait, how did we end up with hangman this episode? Well, we really wanted to talk about Star Trek, and we needed to rush a story in to go along with our conversation, so we figured this one would be great. It was only a thousand word long, so it was easy to turn around a little faster. Hey, can I make a new rule for the Dune Steve just right now on the air? Maybe, but I reserve the right to say absolutely not once you tell me what it is. Can, can we discourage people from sending stories that are shorter than a thousand words? Okay. My preference is that it be between a thousand and, and, and maybe five thousand words. And if it's longer, I prefer that than if it's shorter. Mostly it's just because somebody will send us a story and it's 600 words long. And if there's anything to that story, again, this is my personal opinion, if there's anything to it, then it's worth making a full length story or a full flash fiction story. <laughs> what is the exact definition of a flash fiction story? I don't know if there is a definition. I, well, I think it, the tendency is flashes between one and 2,000 words. I pretty much agree with that rule. There's very seldom that I want to accept a story that's shorter than 1,000 words. It's like you say, but it seems like it's it's a good seed of a story, but it's still missing a little bit here and there. I think it's probably got a lot to do with the fact that I want there to be a character. I want there to be more development so that, you know, when whatever thing happens, we feel more when it happens than, uh, than you will if you get 300 words. You know how people will say things are a double-edged sword? Yeah. The, the, the short, short story length, it's kind of a an edgeless sword <laughs> in that the story <laughs> is so short... That we're probably not going to accept it. But if I see in the subject line that a story is 700 words or 800 words or 1,000 words, I immediately read that one because I know, hey, I can have this one done in 10 minutes. And there's yet another story I've uh, – You can mark off another one of your New Year's resolutions. See, I did my work. I read the 200-word story. Like I said, there's no edge on there, this sword. There is a 6,000-word story. I'll leave that one for big. It's, it's, it's more of a baseball bat than a sword. <laughs> For example, I wrote a story recently, and it was it was very short. But it wasn't uh, what what do they call the one hundred word stories? The drabble. Yeah. Okay. It was too it was too long to be a drabble, but it was too short to be a, a legitimate short story, I guess. And I sent it to you, and you said, "Yeah, is this is the makings of a really good short story?" <laughs> and I'm like, "No, no, no, no makings. It's done." And you're like, "Oh, okay." So we send it in, and promptly rejected. <clears throat> there you go. I, I don't want to discourage everyone from sending in super short stories because Abby had sent this one in, and thank goodness she did because we were able to get this episode in, not under the wire, but within a football field of a wire. We got it in in the underwire. Oh, but they put those kind of things in bras. Ah, I don't own a bra myself. Yes, and you'll never be very close to one either. Nice one. Well, we've only ever done a couple of stories that were this short, and I feel like for the people who don't listen to any of our conversation afterward, well, they can just move on to the next one. There, there are probably lots of podcasts with super short stories, right? Yeah, I think there are. So I shouldn't feel bad. I, I think other people have submitted super short stories that will probably run, and we didn't know, well, do we run more than one in an episode? Or do we just have like a mini episode during part of the week and then do another one later? Or do we do a super short story and then an extraordinarily long conversation afterward? Well, considering that you'll be involved, I'm sure you'll want to hear yourself more and more. So we'll just do the extra long conversation to go after the short story. 
I'm going to pretend that you, you were not mocking me in any way. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. What did you think of the story, by the way? It was goofy and silly, and, and I really enjoyed reading it, to tell you the truth. In a way, it felt like a kid's story. If you are a kid in the Manson family, would you let your kids listen to that story? <laughs> I don't know. I guess when the girl's head pops off, that might be the uh, part that says, yeah, maybe the kids aren't ready for it quite yet. <laughs> uh, I know you haven't edited the episode yet, but give me a, a preview of what sound effect you think you might do for the head popping <laughs> oh, off. I don't know. Maybe I could just use the uh, standard. <laughs> cool. That works. <laughs> All right, so if you have a story uh, that you'd like to submit to the Dune Steve, go ahead and drop it in an email and send it along to submissions at dunesteve.com. And do take a look at our submission guidelines. If you listen to the show, you probably got a pretty good idea. But if you don't listen to the show, then you're not hearing me tell you right now to look at the submission guidelines. So is, now I'll is that stop. is that a double edged sword? <laughs> I guess that is a no edged sword. I'm as well. not really sure if I understand the definition of a double edged sword. It's kind of like irony. You know, people think they know what irony means, but then along comes Alanis Morissette. Oh, right. We've covered this, haven't we? I think so. Do you mind if I, I interrupt the wonderful flow of our conversation? Uh, well, I, it, it's just <laughs> – you said uh, the submission guidelines are on www.doonsteef.com. Oh, uh-huh. And I just – I've been sitting here week after week just nodding like I know what it means, <laughs> kind of like irony or double-edged sword or personal hygiene. Just there are these words that people bandy about that I don't know what they mean. Doonsteef is one of them. What, what is – what the heck is Doonsteef? Um, to tell you the truth, I don't know either. It's just a word that announcer man came up with and he said we should call it this and listen. You're kidding. I thought he never contributed anything to the show and here the the title of the show. Yeah. Just a second. Hey, announcer man? Uh, announcer man, can you come in here just for a minute? No way. Please, just it'll just take a second. You can hold it, just don't exhale. You're mocking me, aren't you? Hey, announcer man, uh, Big was just telling me that you you came up with the word Dune Steve. Uh -huh. Do you mind telling me and and the the listener here come up by the microphone? What is uh, what does Dune Steve mean? Oh, Dune Steve is a species of alien that I invented with my Trekkie friends. They come from the planet Dune Stevie. Really? Really? Huh. I guess that's kind of. Dude, we're a Trekkie podcast. Um, let me get this frog in my throat, and uh, we can talk about, uh, if you don't mind. Maybe since we're a Trekkie podcast, we should talk about Star Trek. It just came out to us, <laughs> to the listeners. This is a form of time travel. You know, already is, well, will Obama be reelected? <laughs> but just remember back to the day before it came out on DVD and there was a sequel already in the works to when J.J. Abrams' 2009 Star Trek was coming out. <laughs> So it turns out I got to see Star Trek the other day. Warning, spoilers. Yes, please don't listen to this. If you plan to see the show Star Trek, or or you don't ever listen. plan on having children or intercourse, frankly, don't, don't listen to what we're about. That's right. See, we well, wait to tell people about what we think of the movies that we see over the summer because we don't want to spoil it for them. So we go ahead and give everybody a couple of weeks to see the movie and then they can hear our impressions. And maybe it also has to do a little bit with the whole turnaround time of editing. Because, I mean, who watches a movie when it's not at least opening week? Nobody does anymore. Nobody does. Or in Wolverine's case, if it's not opening day, you know, <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> I have to apologize because my voice is rather. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. It's off. You could say that. It's a little strange because you've had a, a a nice allergy attack. I did. I either had a summer cold strike exactly when allergy season hit, <laughs> or it was just a really really bad allergy time, and this eye swell swelled up, swelled up. Swole. It swole up like, a, well, like Angelina Jolie's lips, I would imagine. Yeah. And, uh, it would, it you had that beautiful bee stung eye look that everybody's right. trying to get All these days. All those women get uh, <laughs> fat removed from their buttocks and planted into yeah. their eyelids. Oh, that's It's nice. such a great, it's, it's the fad of the 22nd century. <laughs> But enough about the 22nd. Let's talk about the 23rd century. That's right. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard the worst segue in the history of Our SAG show. and weighing. 
But anyways, uh, yeah, I actually got to see this show. I wasn't planning on it. I'm not a Trekkie. I'm, whoa, 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 whoa. Didn't you watch Star Trek all through high school? I'm, I'm afraid I was busy having sex in high school. Oh. <laughs> I have seen some. I think I've mentioned in previous shows that there was a time when I got home from work right as the reruns of Next Generation were being aired. So I just happened to start watching it, and I watched pretty faithfully for at least like six months. Oh, and that was every night episodes kind of a thing, you know. It wasn't the once a week things. Of the old show, though, that this movie goes along with, I've maybe seen like five or six episodes. I've really hardly seen any episodes at all of this show. And I've seen some of the movies I have. I guess I've probably seen almost all of the movies. One of them I wish I hadn't because it was awful. That would be Star Trek V. I need my pay. So I wasn't really planning on going to see this. I figured I'd probably see it on DVD like I saw all the other Star Treks. But it was it was a preview showing. I actually saw it before the real fans saw it. A friend of mine called me up and he says, Hey, I got free tickets from the radio station. They're doing a preview show. Let's set the scene. What were you doing when he called? <laughs> well, I was sitting down to the computer and I said, Crap, I really got to get this episode finished up and edited so that I can get it out on time. And then he called. And so I said, You know what? We don't really have a lot of fans that are looking forward to anything that we do. So we don't need to worry. We'll just put it off a few more days. Can I interrupt your story? This this is kind of the opposite of a hate letter, but it just came to me. Uh, uh, Dear Rish and Big, my name is Jerome and I'm a death row inmate. I am set to be executed next Tuesday. If you could hurry up and post the newest episode, I would be able to listen to it before I go. Signed, Jerome. Aww. Of course, this was forwarded to us by his family because he went to the chair. And uh, oh, that's too two, days later, two days later, we I put posted that episode. That episode. Well, Star Trek was more important than Jerome after all. So I went and saw it, and uh, I saw it before Rish. I saw it before, well, I guess I can't say before all the Trekkie nerds, because at this showing they had, I think they called themselves a Star Trek social club? Something that's like, I don't know. that contradiction. Yeah, it is. I guess maybe that's the only way that Star Trek fans manage any social interaction is by way of getting together and talking about Star Trek. So yeah, there was a couple of Star Trek dorks that were up there at the front and they were asking trivia questions and giving people prizes and the prizes consisted of Star Trek action figures and Star Trek cups and you know how jealous i am of you right now <laughs> i almost won one of the things too one of the questions was which uh which tv show did leonard nimoy and william shatner appear on opposite sides of the iron curtain and people started throwing out guesses and nobody was getting it right and i was thinking huh what show and the one that came to mind was get smart for some reason but what I actually said was, Man from Uncle! But I didn't say it loud enough. I was just like, Oh, maybe it's Man from Uncle. And then they finally gave up. And they're like, Okay, nobody got that one. The answer was Man from Uncle. And the people sitting right in front of me were like, Hey, you said that. You should have won. But I didn't. It's too bad because it was an Uhuru action figure, which you get a little more action out of those figures than others. <laughs> Can you at least say her name correctly? She was no. rather hot. I no, mean. I can't. I'm afraid. She was. You know, I, I saw some stupid little thing on the internet where they were comparing the new characters to the old characters. And they were trying to say, you know, which is better? Old Uhuru? How the hell did you say it? Uhura. Okay. Old U. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't say it. Old chick or new chick? I guess I'd have to say new chick. I'm not a fan of the old show, so she doesn't hold any, uh, you know, nostalgic hotness for me. How about you? What would you say? New or old? Yeah, I thought the new one was pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. And I know she was a role model and inspired a whole <laughs> generation and all that, but they never gave Uhura anything to do. Yeah, they show. gave. She was way bigger character in this film than she was in all those shows put together, I would say. I agree. Now, maybe I should clarify that I am a Star Trek fan, and I guess compared that makes you to. a Trek O, I think. Okay. <laughs> But I, I think compared to the normal person, yeah, I'm, I'm a giant Star Trek fan. Uh -huh. I don't consider myself a giant fan. I don't own a uniform. But I did go to a convention. Really? Uh, I wanted to meet Patrick Stewart and Brent Spiner. And uh, it was my dream to be an extra on Star Trek and never got never to got achieve that. that. Huh? It's too bad. Deep Space Nine was over by then, right? Right, yeah. I, when I was an extra, Voyager had also ended. And so... 
Enterprise would have been my only chance. Your only chance. And you I could didn't. have been on Scott Bakula. Wow. You're mocking me, aren't you? No, 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 no. Buzz, look an alien. Where? <laughs> I, you know, I, I do have a, a love for Star Trek. And, I, ha- I have a like for Star Trek. I'm definitely not a hater. Okay, well, you know, that's good. And I think that the Star Trek fan has been maligned for a long time. Yeah. And partly they brought it upon yeah. themselves. It's, but not entirely. It's, it's just... Uh, Star Wars fans have been trying to overtake them in recent years, too, which... I remember when I first met you, you would talk with pride that you were a Star Wars <laughs> fan and not a Star Trek fan. And you looked down on Star Trek fans because they were geeky yeah. and they made their own costumes and they were fat <laughs> and they would get together and quote ad nauseum their their the favorite shows and not long after i met you the star wars fans started to do the same thing yeah, and i remember you came just came out of the woodwork and i, I became ashamed it was sad because sure you were a fanboy dork but not nearly as big you know it was like the the coolest fanboy you could be was being a star wars fanboy but that's not the case anymore what would you say is the coolest fanboy now? Um, I think a lot of the, the kids from our generation who are now men have parlayed a lot of that fan-centric devotion to sports and they have the fantasy football league and fantasy sports things and that's still considered – I mean that's still going to be the top rung of <laughs> fandom is the sports. I mean even though you guys are all mouth-breathing Neanderthals – Right Here now, comes buddy. the asteroid, buddy. Who's breathing through their mouth today, huh? <laughs> I'm doing an impression of uh, I'm doing by George Takei accent, the author of Star Trek. <laughs> Believe it or not. Speaking of that accent, I kept doing that. <laughs> I was watching that show with my friend, and we were just sitting there, and every time Sulu would say something, I'd go, oh, bye, Captain. Oh, bye. <laughs> I would say that to my friend. He would laugh every time. My friend, who got the free tickets, I think he's probably much less of a Star Trek fan than I am. It was interesting, the two of us winding up there watching this show. So what did you think of the show? Yeah, I, I liked it. Yeah? All right. See you later, folks. Good night. Thanks for listening. Thank you for (laughs) this episode is dedicated to the memory of Jerome. So you liked it. You know, I liked it too, but uh, I don't know. I guess I was expecting a lot more of it because I heard a lot of people who were all excited, all the fanboy dorks at where I work. I talked to them and I was like, yeah, you guys going to see Wolverine when Wolverine was coming out? Eh, I think I may see it Sunday or Monday, you know, still got to see it opening weekend. But, you know, when you go to see it Sunday, you don't care at all. <laughs> but uh, and as soon as he's finished saying that, he's like, oh, yeah, but Star Trek's coming out next week. We're going to all leave straight here from work and go right over to the theater and we're gonna watch it and it's gonna be so awesome i was like really star trek is the show that's got you guys all excited and then i have a friend who's he's like the most loyal reader of rottentomatoes.com that i've ever met and he's oh you're going to wolverine oh well i won't tell you what it got on the tomatometer at least it's six percent higher than ghosts of girlfriends past <laughs> I'm like, oh, thanks. See for- see if anybody should be dating less than me <laughs> with my perennial George Decay impersonation. <laughs> it should be this guy. And yet... He's married. There you go. Has a child. Owns but, his own house, too. Yeah. yeah. The next week, he's like, oh, here's what Star Trek got on the Tomatometer. And it's got like 95 out of 100 or something like that. Just, I mean, it was a good show, but it doesn't deserve that high of praise, I don't think. I mean, I remember last year, some of the shows that I think were really, really great, like Wally or Dark Knight, I think those both stand at least head above, maybe not head and shoulders above, but at least head above Star Trek. And yet those shows last summer also only got 95 on their rating, which it just didn't seem right. But I'm not sure how the tometer works. I think it's just if your review is positive, then it gets a positive point. And if it's negative, then it gets a negative point. And they have like 100 reviews. And so whatever amount you get positive or something. So Well, like Leonard Melton, every review says, there were parts of this movie I liked. And there were parts of this movie I didn't like. So what kind of point does that get? I guess it all depends on the overall, how many parts there were that he liked and how many that he didn't like or something. I don't know. So I guess it's not a perfect score, but I think Wolverine had like a 37. 
And I guess probably most people in our audience are right now saying, yes, and it deserved a 37, and Star Trek deserved a 95, and you're an idiot. You said it, Big. But I didn't think that they were that far separated, the two. I didn't hate Wolverine. There was parts in that movie that I liked, and there were parts that I didn't like. But all in all, it was all right. I would have given it at least a 60 or something. Maybe in a 70. On a scale from 1 to 100. Yeah. Okay. Did we talk about this last week? With people proclaiming Wolverine to be absolute crap and me saying, look, it's not absolute crap. You can say that now. It's something that I complained to you about before we yeah. started the podcast. It's just the people in this generation, everything sucks. I've got a cousin who's 15. And that sucks. And this show sucks. And you suck. Suddenly I got even more nasal. Wow. And she is just so difficult to be around. It's just like <laughs> she just sucks all the light out of a room. She's an effing black hole with a pair of shorts Made on. Made out of red matter. I, I, I have a real hard time being around people like that, that just everything sucks or, or everything is the worst thing ever. And I've heard a lot of people criticize Wolverine, and I think most of their points are probably valid. But it wasn't the worst movie ever. No. It wasn't Jim Cotta. Jim Cotta was a movie that I saw when I was a teenager, and that's my personal vote for worst movie ever. Yeah, I've, I've seen some movies, especially in my time when I was reviewing movies on a website, that were just deplorable, that were just so, so bad. And it was really rare that I would find a movie that would be absolutely worthless, that would be what my cousin would call sucks. The Incredible Hulk or something like that. You know, it's like, hey, what did you think of The Incredible Hulk? It me sad. And I was like, wow. I, did it really? Well I, well, I know that part of it is that the kids of this generation are so coddled and so spoiled. Everything is handed to them that maybe their idea of good and bad is completely skewed. Just as maybe a, a starving child or somebody that grew up in a concentration camp, you give them a can of beans and they love you for the rest of their life. They have no way of gauging that a can of beans isn't that awesome. Mm -hmm. So bringing it back to Wolverine and then to Star Trek, there are movies that I absolutely hate. Okay, so you mentioned Jim Cotta. <laughs> uh -huh. Is, was that wrong? Is that what it was called? Yeah. No, you're right. Uh, probably a big tentpole shitty movie. Sorry, folks, but this is explicit. <laughs> Oh, From our generation was Batman and Robin, the 1997 Ooh, yeah. Joel Schumacher debacle that almost killed the Batman franchise. It killed that Batman franchise, as it were. It was a billion-dollar franchise back when a billion dollars meant something. And then, yeah, it, it, it pretty much went away. But even that, I recommended people see because it was so bad <laughs> that to me it was almost entertaining. If I ever were to turn on a TV and that was on – and Mr. Freeze is like, take that, bud boy. I think I would watch it because I would laugh and, and, and probably be reminded of, of a simpler time in my life where I still thought that there was a light at the end of the tunnel in, 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 in adulthood. <laughs> um, but I, I guess what I'm saying is if, if Generation Y has Wolverine and Generation X had Batman and Robin, they win and we lose because Wolverine is so much better than Batman and Robin. Anyway, I'm, I'm well, sorry. Let me yeah. grab the wheel and turn us back to talking about Star Trek. I liked Star Trek quite a bit. I, I would like to see it again because, you know, a part of me was really put off by the ad campaign. I, I just mentioned Warner Brothers' biggest franchise. Paramount has Star Trek. Uh -huh. They also had something called Indiana Jones. They don't really own that. Lucasfilm owns that. And there was a long stretch with no Indiana Jones movies. So that was kind of a dead franchise for them. But they had one franchise that was really a big deal. Mission Impossible. You, you can name whatever we want. But Star Trek was their baby. We're talking about a 40-year-old multi-billion dollar franchise. And then suddenly this new J.J. Abrams movie comes out. And the whole ad campaign is based around, This is not your father's Star Trek. And I got to admit that my hackles went up every single time I saw that. My father is 70 years old. <laughs> and yeah, he introduced me to Star Trek via syndication when I was a little kid. He's an old man, though. It, it, it felt like 
We want to distance ourselves from all these 40 years of wasted entertainment, all those video cassettes and laser discs that are piling up in landfills someplace, bald chicks and Mork from Orc and Captain Pickard and all this crap that we don't want to identify ourselves with. And I thought, well, there is a reason that this franchise has lasted as long as it has. And that reason is people like me who loved Star Trek and would watch it week to week. And it didn't matter who was in the captain's chair as long as it was Star Trek. And we would go to those movies again and again. And now, you know what? I don't own a Starfleet uniform. But if I did, I wouldn't be ashamed of it. There's something hopeful and pure and just amazingly decent about the whole world of Star Trek. It's an optimism that, that hasn't existed in this world since the Kennedy days. Well, not anymore, because this is not your father's Star Trek. It sucks. That's just kind of the impression that I got. You know, I had heard that J.J. Abrams had never seen Star Trek, and he wasn't familiar with it, and, and he wanted to make a film that would appeal to everybody, and not just Star Trek fans. And so that's cool. The most successful one was the whale one, was the, the Voyage Home. And that was the one where people who weren't Star Trek fans went, and they enjoyed it, almost yeah. as much as we did. That See? one made more than a hundred million dollars. Back when a hundred million dollars meant something. Yeah, when it meant something. Yeah, this you know, one What's, almost made 100 million already. So what's crazy is they've been talking about first contact as the benchmark that it opened with $30 million in 1996. And they said, in today's dollars, that's over $50 million. And I just thought, wait a second, 1996 was about eight minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel that way myself. So J.J. Abrams, who I like, I'm a fan of his television work. I think he's a really good storyteller. I, I think as much as people talk about Battlestar Galactica as the greatest show ever, uh, it's very possible that people will talk about Lost when it finally ends <laughs> as the greatest show of the O's. And so he set out to make this, this very accessible movie. But I guess Paramount or the ad geniuses got a hold of this very accessible movie and said, no, 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 no. Let, let's not say that it's something that fans and non-fans can enjoy. Let's say that it's just for the non-fans. <laughs> and I felt slighted and I felt like I was not appreciated. And you weren't. They basically, I think, are saying, we know you fans are coming one way or the other. We need to get the other folks going way off track. It's the same kind of thing. You know, I've been a soccer fan for a while, and I'm kind of one of those crazy hardcore fans that wears the wig in the stadium and bangs on the drum and brings a flag and yells nonstop the entire game and all that kind of crap. But, you know, I always get that feeling from the soccer team. You know, they're like, we know you're coming. So, you know, you, you'll be in the stadium and like the dorks that come out and throw out the foam soccer balls or whatever is the little prize to everybody. They'll come along, they'll throw it all along the stadium, and then they'll just kind of skip past us and go on and throw them to the other. Because those people don't give a crap about the team. They're not going to come unless they get something special. I think it's the same kind of thing as that. Star Trek fans, you guys are going to come. Whether it's Enterprise or Voyager or whatever, you'll show up. You know, I, I didn't get that impression from the film itself. There were lots of interesting references that I'm sure I got that you wouldn't have gotten. That's like probably true. The reason Scotty was marooned out there was that he had done a transporter experiment on Admiral Archer's prized beagle. And Captain Archer was Scott Bakula's character on Enterprise, and he had a beagle. Ah, that's cool. They tried to make sure that they threw in those iconic lines that each character had. You know, they made sure that Scotty says, I'm giving it all she's got, Captain! And of course they had Spock saying, live long and prosper. And I, I'd be willing to bet that they probably won't do that in the sequel. You know, now they've given a nod to everybody's favorite little thing. Perhaps the biggest failing of the show is that they had to spend that much time and in, in bring in, okay, here's Scotty. Oh, and here's Chekhov. And they all had to have something worthwhile to do. This is what Kirk did when he was born. This is what he did as a child. This is what Spock did as a child. Which I think that was probably the scene that I disliked the most. Maybe you liked it a lot, but the Vulcan bullies. Just the whole concept of a Vulcan bully doesn't seem to jibe. Are they supposed to be all logical and not emotional? And what part of being a bully is logical? You know, it's, it's basically 100% emotional. And these... Vulcan kids are come to try and get an emotional response out of the human because he's not logical or whatever. That may be some people's favorite part. 
I have to admit that my favorite character in the show was Chekhov. He was really cool and he was fun the whole way through. Did you go with your wife? No, it was just my friend that was there. And and your friend didn't know Star Trek at all? Oh, he knows as much as as any anybody else does. I mean, you can't not know it at all. I mean, well, see, I'm I'm wondering if somebody who truly was not a fan, maybe a, a young person who was not around when Star Trek was such a giant part of of our culture, went to this, and they didn't know who Sulu was or Chile. Dubai. That's right. They didn't know that all these people eventually would form a an crew. iconic crew, a family, if you will. If they would find a lot of that dull or if they would find the whole thing fascinating, it's like, oh, okay, so they all have pointed ears and they all have the same haircut. It's not because a haircut. Their hair just grows to that length and then never grows again unless you shave it bald. Nero was not a Vulcan. No, what, wasn't there a bald Vulcan chick in uh, Wrath of Khan and et cetera or she was Delton. Uh, oh. Nerd! <laughs> but hey, if I hadn't said that, if I had said she was Vulcan, then Kevin Anderson would have gotten after me. Nerd! I owe it to the, the Star Trek fans. And you know what? When I was a teenager and I was a fan of whatever it might be that was geeky and you might get beat up for or made fun of, you know, I would hide that. I wouldn't want anybody to know. But now that I'm an adult... And I frankly don't care uh, what some proud of your in. nerddom. I am. That show brought me a lot of joy. I'm happy to mention that Ball I've girl. seen all of the was, Star Trek films. And, and was Kirstie Alley the Vulcan then? She was a Vulcan, yeah, okay. but she had hair. Was the Delton? Was she in part two, or was she just in part one? She was in part one, and, and she died in that film. Oh. So she was never That's heard what I don't from remember again. Very well. Nerd! Yeah. My Red. cousin and I get together. Every Tuesday, the way that you and I get together every Monday. And we've been watching Star Trek a great deal lately. And so it has reignited a lot of my passion for when the show was really good and it was still on TV. And I would watch it every week and look forward to the new episodes. And a lot of these things he's seeing for the very first time. And he'll ask me, like, when Undiscovered Country came out, what did people think? And did they like it? or did they- Etc. And, and so he and I saw this new film together, and uh, we simply do not have time for this crap. I may have come across a little bit too nasty on this. I I like that Star Trek was a hit, and that a lot of people that maybe didn't have any interest are watching it, and maybe they'll have interest in watching the old Bill Shatner show. I like that everybody is suddenly thinking that Star Trek is cool, and you know what? It was always cool. When I was sitting in the theater and I was just thinking, gosh, can you imagine like when we're old, 50 years from now, what kind of a wealth of material there will be in this franchise? Like 10 series, 20 movies, probably a gazillion books. And what about 100 years from now, etc.? What are these franchises that have been started in this century going to be like? Are there other franchises that have been around for 100 years? I came up with, what, like the Three Musketeers or something. But nothing really comes close to stuff that's new now. And I wonder if those will carry on. How, how long of a life do you think these uh, franchises have? We live in a, in a, a very recycled entertainment environment. Yeah, what's the deal with Everything that? is remakes or sequels or spinoffs. Or prequels. And, or prequels. Within the last, I'd say, 10 years, there's been something new called a reboot. Ah. And we've seen this happen a couple of times. For example, Batman Begins or last year's Incredible Hulk or, in my opinion, the best example, uh, Casino Royale, where they rebooted the James Bond franchise, a, a franchise even older than the Star Trek franchise. But instead of saying, this isn't your father's James Bond, <laughs> douchebag, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They went back to the source material and actually adapted an Ian Fleming book. And they made, in my opinion, the best of all 20, however many you want to consider James Bond movies, James Bond movies. So I think within the next decade, we'll probably see a lot more reboots. Yeah, and, probably. Uh, it, it's just something that... Aren't I, they already talking about rebooting Fantastic Four as well? Well, it's just the idea of a reboot basically is that there is something wrong with the franchise. It's based on that. There is something wrong and we need to start over. You know what I mean? Wolverine is not a reboot. Wolverine is a prequel. Phantom Menace, as maligned as it is, is not a reboot. It's a prequel. A reboot says we're going to toss out all that has come before and start anew. 
And I can see the, the potential in that. Suddenly, we've got a blank page and we can do whatever we want, which is interesting. I don't think it necessarily says something is wrong per se, but it, I think it might be saying, you know, we've done as much as we can with the Joel Schumacher angle that we were taking before. So now it's it's time to start over. No, and, and, and that, that may be valid. I, I happen to disagree. I think if there's nothing wrong with a Friday the 13th franchise, you make Friday the 13th part 12. If you think that it's completely gone off the rails or stupid or whatever it might be, you say, this one is called Friday the 13th again, and you just start it over. That movie, the Friday the 13th reboot from this year, could easily have been called Friday the 13th 12 and just been another bunch of teenagers get hacked up by Jason. They're rebooting The Nightmare on Elm Street. They rebooted Halloween two years ago. And that easily could have just been another Michael Myers hacks up a bunch of teenagers. But they said, no, no, let's start over. Let's pretend that all that stuff never happened. And with the James Bond franchise, I think it was great the way that they did it. And I plan on seeing those James Bond movies until I'm a very, very old man. And I think there's enough potential in that. As you talked about century-long franchises, <laughs> there will still be James Bond movies 50 years from now. Probably. I remember after License to Kill came out. They were saying, hey, it's time to start up the James Bond franchise again. Why don't we have Sharon Stone play James Bond and stuff? I mean, it needs that radical a change. And then Why don't they we have a woman play Starbuck? Right. They had six years where it just lay fallow. And then Pierce Brosnan, who was supposed to have been Bond anyway in the 80s, came and, and they revitalized the franchise with Goldeneye. But that was not a reboot. That was just another sequel and took place after the one before. And, and I got to admit, wow, die another day. Completely, completely blue. Sorry, I hate to sound like my cousin. But at the same time, I could see the potential for where that movie could have been really good, which, which makes it all the worse. Don't you think? Isn't it worse to see, oh, the Schwarzenegger that came back from the future killed John Connor and now he's assigned to protect him. What a cool idea. Oh, you're not going to mention that again? Oh, that's that's just a throwaway plot thread? Oh, okay. Whenever somebody does that and, and you can see, wow, this could have been really cool. And it's way worse than, well, that was just another Jason movie with him killing teenagers. There was no potential for that ever to be good. Sorry. Uh, so that does really make me sad. For example, you go and you see the trailer for a movie and you're like, oh, that is, sounds like the coolest idea. And you sit there and imagine what great things they could do with that idea. Then you go and watch the movie and you're like, oh, that's all. You know, being a creative person, that's something that is both a blessing and a curse for me. When I moved to LA, hoping to be a screenwriter and hoping to make films, hoping to open up new worlds for people to watch of my own and for them to say, ooh, that totally sucked. I would get together with other creative people and we would talk about where movies might go next if, if, if there was a hit movie and they're going to make a sequel or we would talk about the potential of things. And in the days leading up to Terminator 3's release, we got so excited about our own version of, of Terminator 3 and how you could, from the footage we had seen in that trailer, how you could make a great, great movie. <laughs> and it was not to be. And I think the biggest example was those Star Wars prequels. We had three years in between each movie, three years in which to talk about how things might progress and how Senator Palpatine might become Emperor Palpatine from Return of the Jedi and all these things. And we had discussed so many possibilities that were really, really rad. And I had so many people on message boards saying, well, this must mean this, only to find that almost none of it mattered and there was almost no thought put to Anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say is it was a blessing and a curse to see where something might go and see the potential in something and then to, to have it fall so short so many times. And I think you and I have had these conversations before, haven't we? I Just uh, recently, a, a friend of mine in LA said that he had a potential screenwriting gig for me. And he, you and I got together and I came up with this idea and suddenly I got all passionate about it. And I'll tell you, if he had offered me $5, I would have sat down and written that whole darn thing because it was just like one of those, wow, this could be really good. Thank you for calling. Thank you for opening my, up my mind to the possibilities of this screenplay. I got $5 in my wallet. I want you to write that story. And then I will put my name on it and publish it. All right. Big, I know you a little too well. You don't have $5. <laughs> Damn. But it's just, I become a little kid sometimes at the possibilities at the endless possibilities for what may be or, or, or what could happen. And because of that, over the last, I'm going to say 15 years or so, 
My favorite part of going to the movies is the trailers. Three or four movies that are going to come out in the future and all of them could be good. <laughs> okay, granted, <laughs> trailers don't always look good. But the point of a trailer is to get somebody excited to say, you know what? We're seeing that one. Oh, uh -huh. honey, I can't wait. for When did they say that it comes out? And I've found, again, since I've gotten to this cynical age or maybe it's not even cynical. It's just I've become an adult. And I see things the way they really are. A lot of times, the trailer is way better than the movie. <laughs> and I, I had a good friend who worked at a trailer house, and it was his job to take the eight minutes of footage that he's been given and to cut that in the most dynamic way to sort of tell what the movie is about. Maybe they already know what the strongest lines are or the funniest parts or the best scenes. Put those, get people excited about the possibilities of this movie. There are things that are worse. There's war. There's poverty. <laughs> there's famine. Have you ever stubbed your toe? Just I like have. on a door I frame, left... it tears off like a layer of skin, yeah. and it hurts so bad that you that I you had oh. to hobble around because my dang toe, right where the cut was, rubbed against the side of my shoe every step I took. There are things that are worse than dashed expectations, than shattered hope, but it sure does suck. Yeah. I guess this was supposed to be about Star Trek at one yeah, point. Yeah, you were going somewhere. You, just... you know, there will be other franchises this decade that will be rebooted. and the decade's almost over. Okay, in the next in 10 six years, months. I'm saying, that will be rebooted. And some of them I'll have a real problem with, I'm sure. Mostly because I feel that reboot equates fixing something that's broken. And other people may not. They're just like, hey, let's get a fresh take on that. And just getting new actors constitutes a reboot, pretty much. We've got to update but, it as time goes by, and I think that it's likely that Star Trek is one of those things that just seems to have legs. It's going to go places, one way or another. That's one thing that I thought was really cool, um, speaking of that, with the J.J. Abrams version, is how when this bad guy comes back in time, and now he's changed the timeline, and uh, now basically we're living in alternate universe Star Trek. And so none of the stuff has to jibe. You know, we've already had a whole crap load of adventures from the old Enterprise crew, and we don't have to do all those same adventures again. We can have all new adventures. And, you know, I understand if people are really bothered by that, that it's, it's just not the same and it negates all that, that came before. And you're just saying that, that Picard's adventures and all that stuff don't happen because of this. To me, once I realized that's what they were doing with the history being altered, I was fine with it. Yeah. It was like, you know what? You guys at least made an effort to explain, OK, this is why – Chekhov and Kirk get on the Enterprise at the same time. Yeah. It's, if you subscribe to a world in which all this stuff is possible and, and, and transporting and, and Vulcans with green blood can mate with humans with red blood, then you should be all right with any little fudges to the timeline. And you know what? Star Trek fans can be the nitpickiest and, and, and really, <laughs> really the most scrutinizing of, of all fans and probably even worse than comic book fans. Although it's possible the comic book fans have actually eclipsed them because Star Trek fans have had enough years of, oh, well, Khan couldn't have known Chekhov's and things like that to just get, get over it. Yeah, when they destroy the planet Vulcan. I saw that happening and I was like, what the hell? I don't know Star Trek a lot, but I know that the planet Vulcan still exists later on. This obviously is not a very good prequel. They've seriously altered the way things are supposed to go. But see, that explains why there are no Vulcans on Picard's Enterprise. And you never run into Vulcans in his time period because so few of them survived Nero's assault. Uh -huh. Aha. If, if you look at the episode, the, the schizoid man, where Dr. Salar, the, the Vulcan uh, doctor on the Enterprise. Enough. <laughs> yeah. They at least did me the service of having Leonard Nimoy come and establish that this is still in keeping with the Star Trek that you've loved for 43 years now. You know what? He'll probably not be in the sequel. And there will be a sequel, just like there will oh, yeah. be a sequel to Wolverine from the week before. You know, I'm I'm grateful that they had Nimoy be in it. And granted, they probably offered him a zillion dollars to do it. He deserves it because it made that film acceptable to me. I don't have to say, yeah, I liked it, but... The uniforms and uh, Captain Pike and, and what about Robert April and, and you know stuff like that which unless you're Kevin Anderson listening right now you're like shut up Nerds! is Kevin Anderson a Trekkie or a Trekker is there a difference between the two in my mind no I don't care what people call me Trekkie is 
super devoted. Trekker is somewhat devoted. Trekkie and Trekker is the same thing. Okay. Trekkie, though, has that negative connotation. You think of the fat guy. You think of Perfect. John Lovitz with the ears on and William Shatner telling him to get a life. And so around that time, the end of the 80s, Trekkies decided to call themselves Trekkers to differentiate themselves from the – but it's the same thing. And you know what? If somebody calls me a Trekkie or a – Or a Star Trek fan. <laughs> you know, I do have a problem when people say Star Trek – or Dr. Spock. I hate both of those things. But <laughs> Dr. Spock was a real person, though. Right, but he didn't have pointed ears, and he didn't come from Planet Vulcan, and he had nothing to do with Star Trek. And and you know what? Next week, you and I will get together, and we'll have new adventures, and I will sound much less nasal. And you know what? I apologize to anybody who's listening right now and just can't stand the sound of my what, what, what? Why would you listen this long if you couldn't stand the sound of my voice? Go put your head in an oven, actually. Wow, you've become the angry Rish Outfield again. Oh. Is this an alternate Rish Outfield now? Yes, uh, you can tell from the goatee. I, our episodes have gotten a lot longer this one's lately. This going to have to be edited down a fair amount, I think. No. And it's just I enjoy talking, getting together with you, finding out what you think about things. And I know I've said it before to you and anybody who's ever listened to me talk, but a lot of times I don't know I think something until it comes out of my mouth. <laughs> That can't be just uniquely me, right? Other people have told me, yeah, I never really thought that I felt that way about girls until I just said it to you. And I was like, well, they are attractive. <laughs> no? <laughs> I guess that's happened to me too. So it's cool that I have a friend that I get together with every week and we talk and we shoot the, you know, and we watch Castle <laughs> and, and, you know, do the stuff that we do. And if people don't like that the episodes are long, they don't have to listen. And that's the, the brilliance of your idea of putting the chatter after the story and – uh, last year we talked for a long time about Wally. We talked for a long time about Dark Knight. So yeah, we've not exceeded what we did last year. <laughs> yeah, we'll be back to talk about Up. I look forward to it. This has been Rish Outfield, and I'm Big Anklevich. In Star Trek, the green chick, the Orion that he was making out with, and right, would you? <laughs> Probably yeah. I like green chicks. Good night. <laughs>